Hello friends and welcome to my channel. In this video, we'll be learning about the anatomy of the spinal cord. Before we learn about the spinal cord in detail, let me give you a brief idea about our nervous system. Our nervous system consists of two main parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system consists of the nerves. The peripheral nervous system is again divided into somatic and autonomic nervous system. In this video, we will be learning about the spinal cord in detail. To begin with, the spinal cord as shown in red right here is a long cylindrical lower part of the central nervous system. It is a main pathway for information connecting the brain and the peripheral nervous system. It occupies the upper two-thirds of the vertebral canal and it is enclosed in three meninges. It gives rise to 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Now looking at the features of the spinal cord, it is 18 inches or 45 centimeters in an adult male and 42 centimeters in an adult female. The weight of the spinal cord is 30 gram and it extends from the upper border of the C1 vertebra or the atlas vertebra as you can see right here to the lower border of the first lumbar vertebrae as you can see right here. Now in the case of children, it extends up to the level of the L3 vertebra, that is the third lumbar vertebra. Superiorly, the spinal cord is continuous with the medulla oblongata and inferiorly, it terminates as the conus medullaris as you can see right here. Now as the spinal cord is much shorter than the length of the vertebral column as you can observe in this diagram, the spinal segments do not lie opposite the corresponding vertebrae. For example, if we consider the T9 spinal segment, it would not necessarily lie in the level of the T9 vertebrae. This is because the length of the spinal cord is shorter than that of the vertebral column. Concising the important points under the features of the spinal cord, it is 45 cm in an adult male and 42 cm in females. Weight is 30 gram, it is surrounded by 3 meninges. It extends from the upper border of the atlas vertebra to the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra. In children, it extends up to the L3 vertebra. Superiorly, it is continuous with the medulla oblongata and inferiorly terminates as the conus medullaris. Spinal segments do not lie opposite to the corresponding vertebrae as the spinal cord is shorter than the length of the vertebral column. Now, let's learn about the meningeal coverings. The spinal cord is surrounded by 3 meninges. The outermost is the dura mater that you see right here. The middle is the arachnoid mater and the innermost is the pia mater. The space between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater is the subdural space and the space between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater is the subarachnoid space that consists the cerebrospinal fluid. Now in this diagram that shows the lateral cross section of the lower part of the spinal cord and the vertebral column, the spinal cord extends in the lower part of the first lumbar vertebrae as the conus medullaris as you can see right here. Below the level of the conus medullaris, only the pia mater is continued as a thin fibrous cord, cord which is called the phylum terminale. In this diagram, you can see the spinal cord, the pia mater, the arachnoid mater and the dura mater. The spinal pia mater undergoes modifications in order to keep the spinal cord in position during the movements of the vertebral column. Ligamenta denticulata, also known as the denticulate ligament that you see right here, are 21 pairs of teeth-like projections. They fuse laterally with the arachnoid and the dura mater midway between the exits of the roots of the adjacent spinal nerves. Here you can see the dorsal root of an adjacent spinal nerve and here is the denticulate ligament. This ligament keeps the spinal cord in position. Now another modification is the linear splendens that you see right here. It is a thickening seen at the anteromedian sulcus in the lower part of the spinal cord. Now the phylum terminale is 20 cm long and consists of two parts. Phylum terminale internum and phylum terminale externum. Phylum terminale internum is the upper part which is 15 cm long which extends up to the lower border of the second sacral vertebra right here. Phylum terminal externum is the lower part 
which is outside the dura mater and is attached to the first segment of the coccyx. Concising the important points under the meningeal coverings, the spinal cord is surrounded by three meninges, the outermost dura mater, middle arachnoid mater and the innermost pia mater. The space between the dura and the arachnoid mater is a subdural space. The space between the arachnoid and the pia mater is a subarachnoid space which contains the cerebrospinal fluid. The spinal cord extends in the lower part of the first lumbar vertebrae as the conus medullaris. And below the level of the conus medullaris, only pia mater is continued as a thin fibrous cord, the phylum terminal. Looking at the modifications of the spinal pia mater to keep the spinal cord in position during the movements of the vertebral column, we have the ligamenta denticulata, also known as the denticulate ligament. They are 21 pairs of teeth like projections. They fuse laterally with the arachnoid and the dura mater midway between the exits of the roots of adjacent spinal nerves. Then there is the linea splendens, which is a thickening at the anteromedian sulcus in the lower part of the spinal cord. And finally, we have the phylum terminal, which is 20 cm long. And after leaving through the sacral hiatus, it extends by getting attached to the first segment of the coccyx. It has two parts, phylum terminal internum and phylum terminal external. Now let's look at the enlargements of the spinal cord. We know that the muscles of our limbs need to be supplied by the neurons of our spinal cord. So the neurons at appropriate levels of the spinal cord form enlargements so that they are able to supply this increased musculature. So we have two main enlargements, the cervical enlargement and the lumbar enlargement. The cervical enlargement is for the supply of the upper limb muscles and it extends from the C4 to T1 spinal segments. The lumbar enlargement is for the supply of the muscles of the lower limb and it extends from the level of the L2 to S3 spinal segments. Concising the points under the enlargements, the muscles of the limbs that form appendages of the trunk have to be supplied by the neurons of the spinal cord. The neurons at certain levels form enlargements to be able to supply the increased musculature. It presents a cervical enlargement for the supply of upper limb limb muscles. It extends from C4 to T1. The lumbar enlargement is for the lower limb muscles. It extends from L2 to S3 segments. Now in this diagram you can observe that a group of nerves that is L2 to L5, S1 to S5 and the coccyx nerves lie almost vertically around the phylum terminal. These are called corda equina as these resemble a horse's tail. Now let's learn about the external features of the spinal cord. This diagram shows a cross section of the spinal cord. Here is its anterior aspect, here is the posterior aspect and this is the lateral aspect. Now anteriorly, the spinal cord reveals a deep anterior median fissure which lodges the anterior spinal artery. Here you can see the anterior median fissure. Now posteriorly, we can see a posterior median sulcus which is a thin longitudinal groove from which a septum runs in the depth of the spinal cord, as you see right here. Now, each half of the spinal cord is divided into an anterior, lateral and posterior regions. Similarly, on this side, we can see the anterior, lateral and posterior regions by anterolateral and posterolateral sulci. Here you can see the two anterolateral sulcus. And here the posterolateral sulcus. Now ventral or motor nerve roots emerge from the anterolateral sulcus and dorsal or sensory nerve roots enter the spinal cord from the posterolateral sulcus. To be more clear about the ventral or motor nerve roots, they are the nerve roots that carry motor information from the spinal cord to the rest of the body. Whereas the dorsal or the sensory nerve roots are the nerve roots that carry sensory information from the body to the spinal cord and then to the brain. Concising the external features of the spinal cord, anteriorly the spinal cord has an anterior median fissure lodging the anterior spinal artery. The posterior median sulcus is a thin longitudinal groove from which a septum runs in the depth of the spinal cord. Each half is subdivided into anterior, lateral and posterior regions by anterolateral and posterolateral sulcus. Ventral or motor nerve roots emerge from the anterolateral sulcus and dorsal or sensory nerve roots enter the spinal cord from the posterolateral sulcus. Now before we learn about the internal structure of the spinal cord, let's clear the concepts of what is white matter and grey matter. 
Now, as we all know, the unit of nervous tissue is the neuron, comprising of the cell body, the axon, and the dendrites. Now, a collection of cell body comprises the grey matter. And the collection of cell bodies in the central nervous system, that is, in the brain and the spinal cord, is termed as nuclei. And collection of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system are known as ganglia. Moving on to the axon, a collection of axon bundles in the central nervous system is known as a tract. And collection of axons in the peripheral nervous system are known as nerves. Now let's learn about the internal structure of the spinal cord. Here you can see an edge-shaped structure that constitutes the grey matter. And surrounding it is the white matter. So the white matter that is the nerve fibers lie outside and the grey matter lies inside. Now in the center of the grey matter is the central canal containing the cerebrospinal fluid. The canal is lined by a single layer of ependymal cells. Now the grey matter that we see here is in the form of an edge with a grey commissure that joins the grey matter of the right and left halves. Here we can see the dorsal grey commissure and here is a ventral grey commissure. Now this grey matter comprises of one posterior horn and one anterior horn on each side in the entire extent of the spinal cord. Here you can see the posterior horn of the right side, the anterior horn of the right side. Here is the posterior horn of the left side and the anterior horn of the left side. Now only in T1 to L2 that is first thoracic to second lumbar segments and S2 to S4 that is the second sacral to the fourth sacral segments there is an additional lateral horn. Here you can see there is presence of lateral horn which is for the supply of the viscera. And this horn is a part of the autonomic nervous system. Now this dorsal horn or the posterior horn is found at all spinal cord levels and it is comprised of certain sensory neurons and these sensory neurons receives and processes the incoming somatosensory information from the peripheral areas of our body. The ventral horn or the anterior horn comprises of motor neurons and these motor neurons innervate the skeletal muscles. Now as you can see in this diagram, it shows the cross section of the spinal cord at different levels and the shape and size of the horns differ in different segments due to certain functional reasons. Here you can see this is a cross section of the cervical, third cervical segment, the sixth cervical, the sixth thoracic segment, the second lumbar segment and the third sacral segment. Now concising the important points under the internal structure of the spinal cord, the white matter that is the nerve fibers lie outside, the grey matter lies inside, in the centre of the grey matter is the central canal containing the cerebrospinal fluid. The canal is lined by single layer of ependymal cells. Now the grey matter is in the form of an edge with a grey commissure joining the grey matter of the right and the left sides. The grey matter comprises one posterior horn and one anterior horn on each side in the entire extent of the cord. Only in these two segments there is an additional lateral horn for the supply of the viscera and this horn is a part of the autonomic nervous system. Now the dorsal horn is found at all spinal cord levels and is comprised of sensory neuron that receive and processes incoming somatosensory information whereas the ventral horn comprises of motor neurons that innervates the skeletal muscles. Now let's learn about the spinal nerves. Spinal nerves arise in pairs. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves as 8 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral and 1 coccygeal. Now in this diagram you can see the spinal nerve. Each spinal nerve arises by a series of 6 to 8 dorsal and ventral nerve rootlets and these rootlets unite in or near the intervertebral foramen to form the spinal nerve. Now let's look at what is a dorsal root ganglion. Now the word ganglion as I had explained earlier is a collection of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. So as the dorsal rootlets converge, there is a swelling called the dorsal or posterior root ganglion. It houses the cell bodies of all the sensory neurons in that particular nerve. And these neurons are pseudo-unipolar in type. Now let's look at the branches of a typical nerve. Here you can see the cross section of the spinal cord. 
here is the dorsal root ganglion as we had seen earlier here is the spinal nerve and here we have its dorsal ramus and a ventral ramus now the dorsal ramus supplies the dorsal that is a posterior one third of the body wall the dorsal ramus does not supply the limbs whereas looking at the ventral ramus right here it supplies the ventral or the anterior two thirds of the body wall including the limbs concising the important points under the spinal nerves the spinal nerves arise in pairs there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves 8 cervical 12 thoracic 5 lumbar 5 sacral and 1 coccygeal each spinal nerves arise by a series of 6 to 8 dorsal and ventral nerve rootlets and these rootlets unite in or near the intervertebral foramen to form the spinal nerve looking at the dorsal root ganglion as the dorsal rootlets converge there is a swelling which is called the dorsal or the posterior root ganglion which houses the cell bodies of all the sensory neurons in that particular nerve in the branches of a typical nerve there is a dorsal ramus that supplies the dorsal one third of the body wall the ventral ramus that supplies the ventral two thirds of the body wall looking at a spinal segment a segment or or part of a spinal cord to which a pair of dorsal nerve rootlets and a pair of ventral nerve rootlets are attached is called a spinal segment and since the length of the spinal cord is smaller than that of the vertebral column the spinal segments do not correspond to the vertebral levels as i had mentioned earlier let's learn about the nuclei of the spinal cord as i had explained earlier nuclei is basically a collection of cell bodies in the central nervous system so the gray matter of the spinal cord that we see here is arranged in three horns anterior lateral and posterior the anterior is motor in function the lateral is visceral efferent and efferent in function and the posterior horn is sensory in function so first let's look at the nuclei in the anterior gray column or the anterior horn of the spinal cord now the anterior horn is divided into a ventral part called the head and a dorsal part called the base the nuclei in the anterior horn innervate the skeletal muscles of our body the most prominent neurons in this anterior horn are called the alpha neurons the smaller neurons are known as gamma neurons now the cells in this anterior horn are arranged in three main groups let's look at which these three main groups are so the first group is the medial group right here second group is the lateral group and thirdly we have the central group now in the medial group we can see that it is present throughout the enti entire extent of the spinal cord and it innervates the axial muscles of the body moving on to the lateral group it is present only in the cervical and lumbar enlargements and it supplies the musculature of the limbs now again this lateral group is subdiv subdivided into three subgroups first we have the anterolateral as you can see it is marked right here anterolateral it supplies the proximal muscles of the limbs that is basically the shoulder and arm or the gluteal region and the thigh muscles then we have the posterolateral group that supplies the intermediate muscles of limbs for example the forearm and the legs and then we have the post posterolateral group that innervates the distal segment that is the hands and the foot then finally looking at the central group it is found only in the upper cervical segments as the phrenic nerve nucleus and the nucleus of spinal root of accessory nerve as mentioned right here after having learned about the nuclei in the anterior horn let's move on to the nuclei in the lateral horn of the spinal cord we have two main nucleus the intermedio lateral nucleus and the intermedio medial nucleus let's look at the intermedio lateral nucleus this acts as both the efferent and efferent nuclear columns and this nucleus is seen at two main levels the first level is seen at the first thoracic to second lumbar segments where it gives rise to preganglionic sympathetic fibers and the second level is seen from second sacral to fourth sacral segments where it gives rise to preganglionic parasympathetic fibers
Now the next nucleus that you see is the intermedio medial nucleus and this is mostly the internuncial neuronal column also known as the interneurons or the relay neurons. Finally let's look at the nuclei in the posterior gray column. There are four main efferent nuclei that are seen in this posterior gray column. First is the postromarginal nucleus right here, then comes the substantia gelatinosa, then the nucleus proprius and finally the dorsal nucleus or the nucleus dorsalis of Clark. Looking at the postromarginal nucleus, thin layer of neurons caps this posterior horn and it receives some of the incoming dorsal root fibers. Looking at the substantia gelatinosa, this is found at the tip of the posterior horn through the entire extent of the spinal cord. Nucleus proprius, it lies subjacent to the substantia gelatinosa as we see right here throughout the entire extent of the spinal cord. And finally, the nucleus dorsalis of Clark, also known as the thoracic nucleus at the medial part of the base of the posterior horn, it extends from the C3 to C8 to L3 segments. Realizing the important points under the nuclei of the spinal cord, the grey matter of the spinal cord is arranged in three horns, the anterior, lateral and posterior horn. The anterior horn is motor in function, lateral is visceral efferent and afferent in function and posterior is sensory in function. The anterior horn is divided into a ventral part, the head and dorsal part, the base. The nuclei in the anterior horn innervate the skeletal muscles. The most prominent neurons are the alpha neurons, the smaller neurons are the gamma neurons and their axons innervate the skeletal muscles. The cells in the anterior horn are arranged in the following three main groups that is medial, lateral and the central group. In the medial group, it is present throughout the entire extent of the spinal cord. It innervates the axial muscles. The lateral group, it is present only in the cervical and lumbar enlargements. It is subdivided into anterolateral, posterolateral and post-posterolateral groups. The central group is present only in the upper cervical segment as the phrenic nerve nucleus and nucleus of spinal root of the accessory nerve. Moving on to the nuclei in the lateral horn, we have the intermedial lateral nucleus and the intermedial medial nucleus. The intermedial lateral nucleus acts as both efferent and efferent nuclear columns. This nucleus is seen at two levels from T1 to L2 segments and from S2 to S4 segments. At T1 to L2 segment, it gives rise to preganglionic sympathetic fibers, whereas from S2 to S4 segment, it gives rise to preganglionic parasympathetic fibers. Looking at the intermedial medial nucleus, this is mostly the internuncial neuronal column. Looking at the nuclei in posterior gray column, we have the efferent nuclear column group. There are four main efferent nuclei, the postromarginal nucleus, the substantia gelatinosa, nucleus proprius and nucleus dorsalis of Clark. Now let's learn about the laminar organization in the spinal cord. On taking thick sections, spinal cord neurons appear to have a laminar or a layered arrangement. There are 10 layers of neurons that are recognized that are known as the laminae of Rext. These are numbered consecutively by Roman numerals starting at the tip of the dorsal horn right here and moving ventrally into the ventral horn. Here we can see laminae 1 to laminae 10. First let's look at laminae 1 to laminae 4. They are generally concerned with extraceptive sensation like pain, temperature, touch and pressure and they comprise the dorsal horn. Moving to laminae 5 and laminae 6. They are concerned primarily with proprioceptive sensations. Laminae 7 that you can see in blue right here is an intermediate zone and acts as a relay between the muscle spindle to the midbrain and the cerebellum. Moving on to the laminae 8 and laminae 9, they comprise the ventral horn and contain mainly motor neurons. The axons of these neurons mainly innervate the skeletal muscles. Finally, in lamina 10, lamina 10 that you see right here, it surrounds the central canal and contains neuroglia. Concising the important points under the laminar organization in the spinal cord, in thick sections, spinal cord neurons appear to have a laminar arrangement. Ten layers of neurons are recognized known as the laminae of Rex. They are numbered consecutively by Roman numerals starting at the tip of the dorsal horn and moving ventrally into the ventral horn. We have laminae 1 to 4 responsible for extraceptive sensation and comprise the dorsal horn. Laminae 5 and 6 for proprioceptive sensation. Laminae 7 are, is an intermediate zone and acts as a relay between muscle spindle to the midbrain and cerebellum.
Laminate 8 and 9 innervate mainly the skeletal muscles and laminate 10 surrounds the central canal and contains neuroglia. What are sensory receptors? The peripheral endings of efferent fibers which receive impulses are known as the receptors. Functional classification of sensory receptors are into extroceptors, proprioceptors, introceptors and special sense receptors. The extroceptors respond to stimuli from external environment that is pain, temperature, touch and pressure. Proprioceptors respond to stimuli in deeper tissues that is for example like contraction of muscles, movement, position and pressure related to the joints. Introceptors include receptor end organs in the walls of viscera or in a gland in the blood vessels and specialized structures in the carotid sinus, the carotid bodies as well as osmoreceptors. Finally, the special sense receptors, they are concerned with vision, hearing, smell, balance and taste. Now let's learn about the tracts of the spinal cord. Now what are tracts? Tracts are a collection of nerve fibers that connect two masses of grey matter within the central nervous system. Now what does this mean? We all know that our central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The grey matter situated in each of these structures lie in different regions. That is in the brain, we have learned that the grey matter is situated peripherally, whereas in the spinal cord, it is situated centrally. So in order to connect the grey matter of the spinal cord with the grey matter of the brain, or vice versa, there need to be a collection of nerve fibers and this collection of nerve fibers that connect these two masses of grey matter to each other are known as tracks. Now these tracks may be ascending or descending and as the name suggests, the ascending tracks will carry sensory information from the spinal cord to the brain whereas the descending tracks will be carrying motor information from the brain to the spinal cord. Now the tracks can also be called fasciculi or lemonisci. Now before we learn about the tracks of the spinal cord in detail, let's look at a basic overview. The tracks are divided into descending and ascending tracks as we saw earlier. The descending tracks are again further divided into pyramidal and extrapyramidal tracks that has further tracks under them and ascending tracks has a few number of tracks under them. So first let's learn about the descending tracks. The descending tracks are of two types, pyramidal and extrapyramidal tracks. So first let's look at the pyramidal tracts which are also called the corticospinal tracts. The pyramidal or corticospinal tracts consists of two parts. First is the lateral corticospinal tract and second is the anterior corticospinal tract. The lateral corticospinal tract lies in the lateral funiculus and the anterior corticospinal tract lies in the anterior funiculus. In this diagram showing the transverse cross section of the spinal cord, we can see the anterior funiculus right here and here is the lateral funiculus. The lateral corticospinal tract lies in the lateral funiculus and the anterior corticospinal tract lies in the anterior funiculus. Now let's understand how these corticospinal tracts or pyramidal tracts are formed. Now in the term corticospinal itself, we can understand that it begins from the cerebral cortex and ends in the spinal cord. So in this diagram we can see here is a motor cortex or the cerebral cortex, here is the thalamus and the internal capsule, the midbrain, pons, the medulla oblongata and here is the level of the spinal cord. So the corticospinal or the pyramidal tracts originate from the axons of pyramidal cells that are seen mainly in the motor area of the cerebral cortex right here. From here the fibers pass through the posterior limb of the internal capsule as you can see in red and through the midbrain, through the pons and through the medulla oblongata and at the level of the lower part of medulla oblongata, 80% of these fibers cross to the opposite side and enter the lateral white column of the white matter of the spinal cord as you can see right here. Now this crossing over of fibers is termed to be pyramidal decusation. And since it crossed over to the lateral side, it is termed to be the lateral corticospinal tract. Now the 15% of the fibers that do not cross enter the anterior white column of the spinal cord to form the anterior corticospinal tract. Now, as the name suggests, since it comes over to the anterior part, it is termed to be the anterior corticospinal tract. 
Now we've seen that the lateral corticospinal tract has reached the lateral column of white matter. The anterior corticospinal tract has reached the anterior column of white matter. Now where do they end? So the lateral corticospinal tract passes through the interneurons, also known as the internuncial neurons, and terminate on the anterior horn cells of the grey matter of the spinal cord. Similarly, the anterior corticospinal tract, it terminates through the interneurial neurons on the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. Concising the important points under the descending tracts, the descending tracts are of two types, pyramidal and extrapyramidal. Pyramidal or corticospinal tracts consist of two parts, the lateral corticospinal tract that lies in the lateral funiculus and the anterior corticospinal tract that lies in the anterior funiculus. The pyramidal or corticospinal tract is formed by axons of pyramidal cells lying in the motor area of the cerebral cortex. From the cerebral cortex, the fibers go through the posterior limb of the internal capsule midbrain, pons and medulla. At the lower level, level of the medulla, 80% of these fibers cross to the opposite side and this is known as pyramidal decusation. The fibers that have crossed enter the lateral column of white matter of the spinal cord and descend as the lateral corticospinal tract. The 15% of fibers that do not cross enter the anterior white column of the spinal cord to form the anterior corticospinal tract. Now let's learn about the extra pyramidal tracts. We have the ruprospinal, the medial reticulospinal, lateral reticulospinal, olivospinal, the vestibulospinal and the tectospinal tract. Now a mnemonic to remember these tracts is Mr. Walt. M stands for the medial reticulospinal, R for the ruprospinal, V for the vestibulospinal, O for the olivospinal, L for the lateral reticulospinal and T for the tectospinal tract. First let's look at the ruprospinal tract. This tract is formed by the axons of the red nucleus situated in the midbrain as you can see right here. The fibers cross with the fibers of the opposite side in the tegmentum and this crossing is termed as ventral tegmental decusation. The tract descends through the pons and the medulla as you see right here and enters the lateral white column of the spinal cord. The fibers terminate by synapsing with the internuncial or the interneurons and ends at the anterior horn cells. This tract, that is the rubrospinal tract, controls the tone of the limb flexor muscles by being excitatory to motor neurons of these muscles. So it basically controls the tone of the flexor muscles of our body. Now let's learn about the medial reticulospinal tract. The medial reticulospinal tract is formed by the fibers from the reticular formation in the pons and descends to the cervical segments only. It lies in the anterior white column of the spinal cord. It has uncrossed fibers as you can see here. It influences the voluntary movement, reflex activity as well as the muscle tone. Now let's look at the lateral reticulospinal tract. The lateral reticulospinal tract originates from the reticular formation in the brainstem, that is the midbrain, pons and the medulla oblongata. And it descends up to the thoracic segments of the spinal cord. It has both crossed and uncrossed fibers. It lies in the anterolateral white column of the spinal cord, as you can see right here. Both the tracts terminate by synapsing with the neurons in lamina 7 of the spinal cord. Looking at the olivospinal tract, its fibers originate from the inferior olivary nucleus in the medulla oblongata. It descends to the spinal cord, it lies in the anterolateral column of white matter and synapses with the anterior horn cells. Looking at the vestibulospinal tract, the fibers arise from the lateral vestibular nucleus lying at the pontomedullary junction. These fibers descend uncrossed to the spinal cord, as you can see right here. This tract is situated in the anterior white column of the spinal cord and these fibers synapse with the anterior horn cells. It has two types, that is the lateral vestibulospinal tract and the medial vestibulospinal tract. The lateral controls extensor muscle tone, whereas the medial is responsible for the movement of the head. Finally, there is the tectospinal tract. This tract is formed by the axons of the neurons lying in the superior colliculus of the midbrain. The fibers cross to the opposite side 
thus forming the dorsal tegmental decussation as you see right here. The tract descends through the pons, medulla and anterior white column of the spinal cord. The fibers terminate on the cells of the anterior horns through the internuncial or the interneurons. It mediates the reflex movements of the head and neck in response to visual stimulus. In this diagram, we can see the locations of all the descending tracts in the spinal cord. In the pyramidal tracts, we learnt about the lateral corticospinal tracts right here and the anterior corticospinal tract right here. In the extra pyramidal tracts, we learnt about the rubrospinal tract shown in blue, the medial reticulospinal tract right here, the lateral reticulospinal tract right here, the olivospinal tract, tectospinal tract, and the vestibulospinal tract. Concising the important points under each of the extrapyramidal tracts, first we have the rubrospinal tracts. This tract is formed by the axons of the red nucleus situated in the midbrain. The fibers cross with the fibers of the opposite side in the tegmentum of the midbrain and constitutes the ventral tegmental decussation. The tract descends through the pons and medulla and enters the lateral white column of the spinal cord. The fibers terminate by synapsing through the interneurons with the anterior horn cells and it is mainly associated with control of tone of the limb flexor muscles. Concising the important points under the medial reticulospinal tract, this tract is formed by the fibers from the reticular formation in the pons. It extends, that is it descends to the cervical segments only. It lies in the anterior white column of the spinal cord. It has uncrossed fibers and it influences the voluntary movement, reflex activity and muscle tone. In the lateral reticulospinal tract, we learn that the lateral reticulospinal tract originates from the reticular formation in the brainstem that includes the midbrain pons and medulla and it descends up to the thoracic segments. It has both crossed and uncrossed fibers. It lies in the anterolateral white column of the spinal cord and it terminates by synapsing with the neurons of lamina 7 of the spinal cord. In the olivospinal tract, we learned that its fibers originate from the inferior olivary nucleus in the medulla oblongata. It descends to the spinal cord, lies in the anterolateral column of the white matter and synapses with the anterior horn cells. Under the vestibulospinal tract, we learned that the fibers arise from the lateral vestibular nucleus at the pontomedullary junction. They are uncrossed fibers. They pass through the anterior white column and it has two types, the lateral and medial vestibulospinal tract. Finally, in the tectospinal tract, we learned that it is formed by the axons of neurons lying in the superior colliculus of the midbrain. The fibers cross to the opposite side, thus forming the dorsal tegmental decussation. The tract descends through the pons, the medulla and anterior white column of the spinal cord. The fibers terminate on the cells of the anterior horn cells and it mediates the reflex movements of the head and neck in response to visual stimulus. Now we'll be learning about the ascending tracts of the spinal cord. We have the lateral spinothalamic, the anterior spinothalamic tract, the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus, the dorsal spinocerebellar and ventral spinocerebellar tract, the spinoolivary and spinotectal tract. Now we can learn this easily according to the sensations that each of these tracts carry. The lateral spinothalamic and anterior spinothalamic tract carry the extroceptive sensations. The fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus carry the proprioceptive sensations. The dorsal spinocerebellar and ventral spinocerebellar tract carry the reflex proprioceptive sensations. And finally, the spinoolivary and spinotrectal tracts are other ascending tracts that are responsible for proprioceptive and visual reflexes. Before learning about the ascending tracts of the spinal cord in detail, Let's look at the sensory pathway. The sensory receptors are activated by stimuli in the environment like heat, pressure, temperature, touch and so on. This information is transmitted to the central nervous system along a series of sensory efferent neurons which are designated as first order neuron, second order neuron, third order and fourth order neurons. The first order neuron is the primary sensory efferent neuron, it is also called the receptor cell. The first order neurons synapse on the second order neurons in the relay nuclei which are located in the spinal cord. 
Now the third order neurons reside in relay nuclei in the thalamus and fourth order neurons reside in appropriate sensory areas of the cerebral cortex. So first let's learn about the lateral spinothalamic tract. This tract carries the sensation of pain and temperature. So the sensations of pain and temperature are carried by the dorsal root of the spinal nerve to the first order neurons which start in the dorsal root ganglia. We had already learned about the dorsal root ganglia earlier. Now these neurons synapse with the neurons present in the dorsal horn of the grey matter of the spinal cord right here. Here the second order neurons begin which cross immediately to the opposite side close to the central canal and ascend as a tract in the lateral white column of the spinal cord as you can see here in orange. It ascends in the lateral white column as the lateral spinothalamic tract. Now it ascends upwards and reaches the level of the thalamus where it again relays and forms a third order neuron that sends the sensory information to the cerebral cortex. Next we have the anterior spinothalamic tract. This tract carries the fibers for crude touch and pressure. The first order neuron fibers are in the dorsal root ganglia, similar to the lateral spinothalamic tract. This relay in the grey matter of the posterior horn or nucleus proprius, that is in the lamina 3 and lamina 4. Now these second order neurons ascend for 1 to 2 segments and cross to the opposite side in the white commissure and ascend as a tract in the anterior white column of the spinal cord. Here you can see in red is the anterior spinothalamic tract. It again relays with the third order neurons in the thalamus from where it sends the information to the cerebral cortex. After having learned about the anterior and lateral spinothalamic tracts that carry the extraceptive sensations, now let's look at the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus that are responsible for carrying the proprioceptive sensations like deep touch, pressure, tactile localization and so on. Now in the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus, we can observe that the first order neurons are seen in the dorsal root ganglion similar to that of the anterior and lateral spinothalamic tract. Now here, instead of synapsing with the neurons present in the dorsal horn of the grey matter of the spinal cord, in the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus, they run directly upwards in the posterior column of the white matter of the spinal cord. And we can see that these tracts ascend upwards and synapse with the neurons that are present in the medulla oblongata. For fasciculus gracilis, we have the nucleus gracilis right here and for the fasciculus cuneatus, there is a nucleus cuneatus present in the medulla oblongata. So these are the second order neurons present at the level of the medulla oblongata. Now from after synapsing with the second order neurons, the tracts cross to the opposite side and continue to the thalamus where they synapse with the third order neurons that is the ventral posterolateral nucleus of thalamus and then send the information to the cerebral cortex. The main difference between the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus is that fasciculus gracilis is present medially shown in red and fasciculus cuneatus is present laterally shown in blue. The fasciculus gracilis begins at the lowermost limit of the spinal cord whereas the fasciculus cuneatus commences in the mid thoracic region. Now let's learn about the dorsal spinocerebellar and the ventral spinocerebellar tracts. They are responsible for carrying the reflex proprioceptive sensations. They convey to the cerebellum both the extraceptive and the unconscious proprioceptive impulses. So first let's look at the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. It begins at the level of the third lumbar segment of the spinal cord as you can see right here. The first order, order neurons are present in the dorsal root ganglion as we had studied till now. They relay in the dorsal nucleus that is the thoracic or Clark's column as uh, that is visible right here. This relay gives rise to the second order neurons which forms the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. 
Now, unlike the other tracks, this tract is an uncrossed tract. That is, it does not cross to the opposite side. It is seen on the same side. It ascends in the lateral column of the white matter of the spinal cord. And it ascends upwards to the level of the medulla oblongata. And then it reaches, through, reaches the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle as we can see right here. Finally, let's learn about the ventral spinocerebellar tract. Their first order neurons are present in the dorsal root ganglion. The second order neurons are derived from the large cells of the posterior grey column as we can see right here. The second order neurons cross to the opposite side. They ascend into the lateral white column of the spinal cord anterior to the fibers of the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. And they pass through the medulla oblongata and the pons. These fibers finally curve along the lateral aspect of the superior cerebellar peduncle and recross with the superior cerebellar peduncle to regain their original side of origin. As we can see, this was the original side of original side, and here it recrosses again to reach its original side of origin. Now, functionally, both the spinocerebellar tracts, that is the ventral and dorsal spinocerebellar tracts, control the coordination and movement of muscles controlling the posture of the body. Now, the other ascending tracts, that is the spino-olivary and spinotectal tracts, are responsible for proprioceptive and visual reflexes. I hope you found this video helpful. To get the notes of spinal cord as well as other notes of anatomy, physiology, biomechanics and other health science subjects, visit my website, the link to which is given in the description below. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.